So look, I think AI can be implemented at each stage of talent acquisition. You know, right from resume grading to automation of responses to social outreach, which plays a huge part in employer branding um, and engaging talent communities. Welcome to the All In Recruitment Podcast by Manatal, where we explore best practices, learnings, and trends with leaders in the recruitment space. If you like our content, please subscribe to our channels on YouTube and Spotify to stay tuned for our weekly episodes. My name is Lydia, and with us today is Brijesh Singh, who is the Director of Talent Acquisition for APAC Middle East at Cap Gemini. Good afternoon, Brijesh. Good to have you with us today all the way from Singapore. Good afternoon, Lydia. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Brajesh, you've spent a large part of your career in technical recruitment for large multinational uh, technology companies. So tell us a little bit about these roles and how you've, how you've built your capabilities for TA in the tech space. Great question, Lydia. So I think I've got around 19 years of experience. I have been out and out, you know, into talent acquisition. I started as an individual contributor. I learned from the basics. Uh, from an agency. Uh, that's where I got recruited through my campus. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, moving onwards to in-house, I've done roles in offshore group, wherein, you know, I'm part of a low-cost country model, uh, you know, sourcing and delivering to the high-cost uh, country models. So, you know, sitting in India, delivering in US or UK or Europe or Asia. Um, so I, And then I've moved to, you know, um, more front end models wherein you know india specific market and then singapore specific market etc and from there i've moved on to leadership roles which has been around now 14 15 years where i've been managing asia pacific and middle east mm. um and uh, that's been my journey into uh, talent acquisition i've also held hr business partnership hr integration kind of a role uh, for a brief stint of two plus years uh, mm-hmm. when I was in my ex organization. Um, but uh, this has been my, my forte. So, talent acquisition and HR business partnership is what I've held so and, far. And what are some observations we've made, maybe about the demand and availability of talent in this space, particularly in, in the regions that you've, you've overseen the past maybe decade or past five years? It's, it's a very interesting uh, question because Talent in Asia Pacific and Middle East is not like, you know, any matured country talent. So it's a very diversified region with, you know, unique nuances, whether it is Mm. cultural um, or whether it is, uh, you know, expectation wise, the nuances are very different. So it's not like one big India market, one big US market or the Europe market. It's very diversified. And the talent movement, you know, if you, Mm. for example, you take a country like Japan, it has an employment for life kind of a culture. So people um, moving from one job to another, one com- company to another is a rarity or it's a, it's a, it's not the most preferred form of changing employment. Mm-hmm. While you look at Vietnam as a market, you know, people are jumping around with the, you know, with the growth that they are experiencing as a country. Um, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia and New Zealand are are more westernized markets. So, you know, you will see they behave like a matured and uh, market, and you see the talent movement. Um, but coming to talent availability, uh, mm-hmm. this this region is really um, it, it's very distributed. So you will have certain skills, and you will not have certain skills. So you know, some of the looking at you know in the Asia, if you look at Banking financial services skills are widely available, but uh, ERP skills are something which take a backseat. So, you know, going into those specifics, you know, there are pools of skills that are available Hmm. widely and there are, you know, niche areas or combinations which are not available. So you've got to, you know, deal with it Uh, from a talent acquisition perspective. it's It's a very difficult market. Because scale is always going to be a problem. It's not a volume market. So what are some challenges you've faced in attracting and even retaining talent? And how have you worked around them? So in the recent times, it has been more, you know, compensation related challenges. Um, uh, We take a very matured 
take at it right so as a function as a person also i am i am aligned that way so um, compensation one is become a big problem in the recent past because people are getting you know um, uncanny increments uh, very difficult to sustain for the long term um and also the expectation of hybrid remote work uh you know flexibility of working all of this has become more important and challenging you know countries like philippines there are people who are working out of you know uh different provinces and they do not want to come to office even for a day in a week so they want 100% uh remote work if there is a possibility so you know elements like this has become a challenge in the recent years um yes and compensation has stayed forever like you know there will always be employers who got deeper pockets who got uh, you know better offers um and i think overall when you really weigh on um the decision should be based on your career trajectory the overall improvement of your compensation as well and the financial rewards are important for everybody but the overall career growth should be given more importance but today it is not it's it's more on the remuneration so what might be some best practices or some ways to to manage this in this environment that we in you know according to my opinion lady i guess mm-hmm. uh, you know it has to be a combination um it has to be an absolute combination of rewards benefits growth culture and flexibility say so all of this uh, needs to come together today to be an attractive employer so your evp has to be you know defined in such a way that you bring in all the elements and you advertise it in the whole cycle so that you really are able to attract and retain talent at the same time yeah the evp point we will move into that deeper a little bit more uh moving back into the role of a town acquisition professional today you know you've described the uh, complexities around attracting talent today right so how would you describe the role of a ta professional in today's context so what does a ta specialist need to be or what do they need to have as as skill sets So Lydia to answer this question I think the foundation doesn't change your core competency of talent acquisition remains the same you know your ability of sourcing end to end recruitment stakeholder management uh, reporting etc all of that you know stays there but I think in today's world uh, the most important element for any talent acquisition specialist is to be the strategic advisor you know you have a seat on the table and you have to make effective usage of that seat so be the strategic uh, advisor bring in the data driven insights for the business to make informed decision and and be an enabler so these are the three core skills today for any talent acquisition professional or specialist to succeed and has your approach to talent acquisition changed in the last very disruptive 5 years Oh yes oh yes i think i think we've moved uh, you know what i inherited in in uh, or what i started with was a very um disintegrated functional you know talent acquisition function from there we moved to a standardized and structured you know model and from there with the disruption we have actually moved to a digitized and personalized uh, model which is uh, which is more to do with you know all the digitization the technology in usage within the function uh, the overall experience a lot of focus on the data and the insights that you're providing uh, you know and 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 the kind of strategies that you're bringing on the table for new market entry expansion mm-hmm. new product new ways of working etc so i think that's um, that's how my talent acquisition has also evolved and the next target is to move towards a creative and personalized or human centric talent acquisition model where you are in a you know proactive mode of aligning with the strategic imperatives building mm-hmm. the pipeline bringing in the talent at the right time and delivering the growth and really functioning as an uh, you know function of enablement and ta leaders also need to look into strategies that would you know uh, obviously fulfill the business needs today but also forecast into the future in terms of town needs and etc so what might be some ways uh, to think about future proofing recruitment 
If you look at talent acquisition maturity model, uh, most of the companies are structured and standardized mode, right? So level two, Mm -hmm. Uh, level three and level four is where the future is. So level three is more digitized and personalized where you bring in the technology experience, et cetera. And then the fourth level where I think there was a survey done uh, by one of the industry analysts. uh, And I think it's about 26% of the employers are only there. So there's a lot to catch up. So creative and human centric is where um, the talent acquisition needs to move. The framework will have to include everything, right? From governance reporting Mm. to core recruiting to uh, EVP and employer branding to, uh, you know, insights, uh, culture and uh, experiences. Yeah, all, all of these elements need to be, you know, brought in together Today, in in future, you are looking at talent acquisition in a very different way, you know, engaging with a talent community or talent Mm -hmm. communities as a whole, bringing in, uh, you know, engaging with the passive candidates. How do you then convert them into active candidates and then finally convert them into hires and then into successful hires? So all the matrix still remains the same, but the, you know, ways of doing it is changing drastically so that these are the elements for future uh, sustainability for talent acquisition. You know, uh, the framework for, you know, anything 2023 and beyond should have mm-hmm. governance and operation, uh, recruitment, of course, the core activities, irresistible experiences, mm-hmm. trusted employer brand, you know, as a, as a messaging, internal mobility and flexible job model. I think these are, you know, the hard elements for any future looking talent acquisition framework. And it's also internal and external stakeholders, yes, right? It does. Yeah. And 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 you know, speaking of technology, automation and this emphasis on, on human centric approaches, there's also widespread adoption of AI into so many parts of the business today. So in terms of talent acquisition professionals, what are the ways they can think around AI in order for them, uh, for talent acquisition professionals to benefit? Great question, Lydia. Very passionate about AI or technology and tools, especially in in talent acquisition. So look, I think AI can be implemented at each stage of talent acquisition, you know, right from resume grading to automation of responses to social outreach, which plays a huge part in employer branding um, and engaging talent communities to uh, dashboard, to building dashboards with insights. Uh, to problem resolution, whether it is, you know, access management, whether it is anything else to do within the cycle. Um, I think AI has a space in each stage and how effectively we build in the technology and use it is dependent on the strategic imperatives and the outcomes that we want to achieve. So you look, there is everything available, you know, but do you want to employ everything If it is aligned to your organizational strategic imperatives, yes. If not, then you pick and choose where do you want to really, you know, put it in place and optimize the usage, optimize the results through AI. So I think AI is is definitely also going to be an integrated, essential part of any system, not only talent acquisition, but talent acquisition, yes, a lot of scope um, and uh, the usage is enormous. Enormous in my in my opinion. Yeah, it is the future. Definitely, because you know, there there's so many different use cases and in terms yes. of talent acquisition, in terms of engagement, in terms of reaching out to a different talent pool, uh ensuring that you get the right kind of hires, etc. But there's you know, on, on that note, I'm also curious to know your your opinion about you know, some sentiments around AI and will this do you think this will erode from the role of a Talent acquisition professional or enrich it? Lydia, great question. Um, it really depends on the strategic imperatives of the organization. So everything has to be aligned to the strategic imperatives, so the direction that we want to go and achieve as an organization. Now, AI, if really optimized and you know, if used intelligently, can give a 30%, 30, 30% and beyond productivity boost. It can also give effectiveness boost efficiency boost, all of this enables talent acquisition to perform the role better, Mm. quicker, 
right? So, you know, your turnaround time has a positive impact. Uh, the cost, um, everything has a positive impact in, in the cycle when you use them, right? So I do not see a reason why anybody should be nervous about it. It is about how intelligently you utilize it to enable yourself towards success versus looking at, hey, AI can now do sourcing. Do I need sources? Mm. Oh, no. But recruitment is still about human element, right? It, it's the commodity that we are dealing with are humans. There has to be uh, you know, a connection, a rapport, uh, overall experience. How do you build that experience without a human touch? So I don't think talent acquisition needs to worry about it. We need to use it to the benefit of our function so that we can perform much better than what we are doing today. You know, utilizing the technology versus being, you know, averse it. I, I think, yeah, that's that's what everybody should be thinking about it. And we're seeing many trends as well in talent acquisition. And that also, it's, you know, we see a rise in contract work and we see a, a more distributed of fragmented workforce. And there's also that need to build connectivity in that workforce, in the team, in tandem with the productivity output. So what do you look for when you search for top talent? Let me address the talent uh, pools and the changing dynamics of the talent pools. I think, yes, it is changing across the world. Um, Asia, Pacific and Middle East is no different. It is changing, but it's changing slowly. You know, contract work, gig work. Mm -hmm. uh, in pockets, they are there. As I said, some countries, it is very prevalent. Some countries, it is not at all there. People have just started to think about it and being open about it, right? So, yes, it is changing. And that's where building and engaging the talent communities of, you know, different slices and dices is very important because that's, again, going to be a future-looking talent acquisition process attraction process, engagement process, and conversion process. So coming uh, coming to the question you asked about, you know, what are we looking at when we are hiring top talent? So I think the two major attributes that are required uh, today, the building blocks of any future looking successful hire or top talent would be growth mindset and attitude. But if you have growth mindset, it's basically fail fast, you get up and run again, that kind of an attitude. Because in this uh, era of disruption, the disruption cycle is getting you know quicker. The frequency of disruption is getting much shorter. faster mm -hmm. yeah, and much shorter. So it is. Uh, it used to be 10 years now, mm -hmm. five years, it's going to be three years. So anybody you know who's trying to do something which works today may not work tomorrow. That's why that growth mindset and a positive attitude is very, very essential part of any top talent hiring. And it's also, you know, in tandem with the growth mindset that you were talking about is that excellence in, in execution. So in terms of a growth mindset for a person in TA or a recruiter, what are your thoughts around that? What are the components of that? While, you know, while we have really transformed in our journey, I think the building blocks, again, remains the same. Uh, the core competency of a recruiter will always stay there. But I think the most important uh, attributes will, again, be somebody who is a strategic advisor, somebody who is uh, bringing you know, data-driven insights for the business or the leadership to make informed decisions. Um, somebody who is enabling the growth, they are enabling the, uh, you know, the business outcomes as a function of enablement. So the understanding, you know, that you have a seat and using it strategically to really contribute uh, from, you know, these aspects is important for any talent acquisition specialist today. So what would you say is the role of an employer to foster a high performance culture today? So according to my opinion, companies with high performing cultures motivate employees mm. to make decisions and act upon their choices. The mindset, you know, the growth mindset um, needs to be instilled and the fear of failure needs to be eradicated. And that's when, you know, you cultivate high performance. Um, whenever you are, you know, taking away that fear that the failure is going to impact in any shape or form, 
then your creativity, uh, everything else, you know, um, gets encouraged and high performance is then bound to happen. So that that's what I think companies with high performance culture should be cultivating. So going back to EVP, which we spoke about earlier, I mean, that there are ways to think about it. So what are some steps to take to develop a strong EVP so that you make sure that your talent strategies for both culture and skill are aligned? Thanks, Lydia. A brilliant question. I think, you know, designing an EVP is uh, easier said than done. The steps is uh, very simple, but it, it, it includes a lot of work at the back end. Now, the, I think the starting point is always baselining or assessing what you are currently offering. And then, uh, you know, the second step would be doing focus group interviews, surveys with your existing and past employees to understand what is really motivating your high performers. So you have to be very um, focused on what group you are choosing mm -hmm. to define these because these, these will be the building blocks of your EVP then this will help you to define the key components of your EVP. You know, financial rewards, um, you know, uh, the benefits, the career charter, the working environment, the flexible, you know, arrangements, et cetera. All of these are building blocks of EVP, right? So that, that's when you will define it. And then you would write a very crisp, a uh, very uh, short and inspirational employee value proposition statement. Um, and then, you know, the next step would be promoting your EVP through the right channels, uh, throughout the cycle, right? From engaging to employee onboarding, uh, the EVP messaging has to go through the right channels. And then, of course, you know, reviewing the results um, of the effectiveness of what you have implemented. So that's how an EVP is basically uh, designed and implemented. You know, you mentioned assessing uh, the results of the success metrics around an EVP, right? So, you know, in your opinion, uh, how often should you reassess or when should you revisit your EVP? See, EVP is predominantly run to, uh, you know, improve the attraction and the retention element of the workforce. So whenever that this these two tangents are going off, whenever these two metrics are showing trends of increase or decrease, respectively, uh, you should be revisiting. So there is something definitely not working, or it needs a revisit, and it has to be you know again um, restructured, redesigned to cater to the newer needs. So whenever these two indicators are indicating. You should you should revisit these as for me. And there's no specific time frame, obviously, right? No, it really depends. It really depends on the evolution of your organization. So what phase of maturity you are in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as a matured organization, you'll be, you know, much more stable. So you will see these trends, uh, you know, peaking or going down in a slum, um, pretty much annual. Cyclical. At best, uh, at at best six months. Hmm. But if you are a growth organization or a startup, you can see this in weeks. So it really depends on the maturity of the organization where hmm. uh, where you are currently positioned, and your EVP cycle of uh, refresh will also accordingly work for you. Hmm. So, what role can a talent acquisition professional play to ensure that that? positive candidate experience born out of that uh, that EVP translates to a fulfilling employee experience? I think many organizations are now trying this out, but I very firmly believe that, you know, today talent acquisition has a expanded role. Mm. Uh, when I was mentioning, you know, future looking talent acquisition framework should have irresistible experience. This is what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. So not only the candidate experience, not only the onboarding experience, it is beyond that. So the first 30, 60, 90 days, what are the touch points? How talent acquisition can step in and make that journey more smoother, uh, the experience more pleasant. And that will basically you know, have multiple advantages. But just from a talent acquisition perspective, uh, it would really help in terms of improving your employee reference. Hmm. Imagine an employee coming through and having a great experience in the cycle 
of selection, right? From the engagement to the onboarding and then settlement, which is your 30, 60, 90 days. This engagement has given this employee such an experience that, you know, he or she is more, is willing to bring in more of them into the organization willingly. Hmm. You do not, you do not have to really go and run campaigns willingly. They will come and, you know, start referring, which will have a positive impact of your pipelining of talent. So yeah, it, it all, at the end of it, it all is going to pay off. We we spoke a little bit about technology earlier, but it was mainly about AI and, and um, the different types of technologies we see today. But let's talk about the impact of recruitment technology, such as uh, Manitou's applicant tracking system, for instance, you know, especially in hiring, etc. So in, you've touched on this earlier a little bit, but what are some key benefits that you've seen? Uh, Lydia, great question. I think according to me, it is an absolute necessity today for the function, whether it is talent acquisition or HR. Technology is not something which can be ignored anymore. Uh, It impacts efficiency, productivity boost. It impacts um, the deliverables that you are expected uh, right from, you know, the dashboards, uh, you know, data driven insights for decision making, the strategic element of advisory, all of this can be achieved seamlessly with the utilization of these technologies. So I think it's an absolute necessity, uh, whether you use it in you know standalone bits and pieces hmm. or you use it as a one-stop solution, but it's an absolute necessity. And it's just, according to me, it's just a matter of time um, that you, you know, piecemeal basis that you are using or most of the organizations are using will then move into a one-stop solution. Uh, because it all makes sense. It's all integrated and it gives you the output that you require. Um, and it's easy, uh, less time consuming, and less expensive, uh, the most important thing, right? So um, I think, I think yes, it's an absolute necessity. Uh, today, tomorrow, everybody will have to graduate to that. So we went, we, we've spent the breadth of town acquisition, really, and, and mainly looking at being future centric looking t- towards uh, the use of, of technology being able to adapt to the different disruptions that we're seeing that are happening closer and closer to to where we are today so what advice would you give someone who's starting out in talent acquisition today Lita, my advice is going to be very different i think anybody who is starting out or in you know as a career in talent acquisition uh let me you know first burst the myth Talent acquisition is not HR. Now, according to me, it is sales. And I have termed uh, you know, it as noble sales. And I'll tell no, you the reason. Noble sales, okay. Yes. And I'll tell you the reason why I have coined it. Because uh, the commodity that we are dealing with or the instrument of sales for us is human being. Of course, so, and you impact somebody's career, livelihood, etc. And that's why I've coined the term noble sales for this profession. But it is not really a core HR job. It's it's out and out sales. Uh, there will there will be always lights, camera, action on you, especially if you are in a services organization or or a technology enabled organization, mm. uh, which is dealing with you know um, improvement of revenue and growth through headcount improvement. Right? Any organization which is dependent, this is going to be the story. So. Uh, and it is in many ways, um, uh, you know, or instances be a thankless job as well. Mm-hmm. So you will need to build those competencies within you, the tactfulness of stakeholder management, uh, the persistence, um, or, you know, in, in many other ways, we say thick skinned, right? So uh, uh, being that thick skinned and also the competency of the technical Uh, enablement, whether it is technology or sourcing or recruitment, all of that has to be enabled within yourself. Uh, But very importantly, it needs to be understood right in the beginning that this is a function which will always have a lot of pressure. It will always have lights, camera, action. Again, I'm repeating it, uh, but it's important for everybody to understand that it will have that kind of a focus on it and it is not for the faint-hearted. 
Thank you so much, Prajesh. You've been very generous with your insights and your findings and also the the, the ways in which uh, talent acquisition professionals or even recruiters today should be looking at the role. I think that's that's been very valuable. So I'm sure there will also be listeners and viewers who would like to connect with you. So where can they find you? So before they find me, Lydia, I also wanted to make a disclaimer. All the opinion that has been expressed by me uh, has nothing to do with any of the organizations that I've worked for or I'm working for. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a completely personal opinion based on my experience over the years in the function. Yes. Um, and, you know, secondly, if you want to look for me, look for me, you know, as Brajesh Singh on LinkedIn, that's where I'm active most of the times. And if you want to look for the company that I work in for, you can go in www.capgemini.com. Look at the website. It's a comprehensive website. You can go to different countries and look at relevant materials, whatever you're looking at. Um, Then that's how you can find us. Thank you, Brajesh. And we have been in conversation with Brajesh Singh, Director, Talent Acquisition for APEC and the Middle East at Capgemini. Thank you very much for joining us and stay tuned for more weekly episodes from All In Recruitment. Recruitment.